Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, founding member of the Counting Crows and now Nashville session drummer and educator, Steve Bowman. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, folks out there in podcast land? Yep, it's that time. It's time for another episode of The Rich Redman Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. I'm talking to musicians, actors, comedians, authors, thought leaders. It is so fun. At least I think so. And I'm really excited about today's guest. We're coming from Nashville, Tennessee. We're coming from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Middle Tennessee. Despite all the tornadoes and madness that we have here, this is the last place for the music business, people getting into rooms, writing songs, collectively creating a piece of art that goes right into your ears. And then we take the music to the people. The machinery is here. This is why Taylor Swift had named her label Big Machine Records, because this is where the big machinery is, folks. Check it out. Um, we've got an amazing guest today, and we were catching up offline right before the show. And of course, we lose all this great stuff because we haven't seen each other in like six or seven years, but like on social media, you can kind of follow each other and you feel like you're in each other's lives, but actuality, six years have gone by. So I feel like a really bad friend, but we're going to catch up in public, <laughs> in a public forum right now. Uh, our guest today, Steve Bowman, is the original founding dr member, drummer of Counting Crows from 1992 to 1994. And then that's not it. He went on to play with bands like Third Eye Blind and Loose and The Bitter Sweets, and he even subbed with Toad the Wet Sprocket and Train, and the list goes on and on. He's a songwriter's secret weapon. He's a great guy. We got tons of history. Say hi to Steve Bowman. Steve, what's up, buddy? Uh, so, glad to, so glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me on, Rich. Yeah, man. It is so, so great to see you. So um, we were just catching up about all our life changes, and I asked you, I was like, Hey, when did we come into each other each other's lives? When do we meet each other? And you said 2006. I'm like, what? What is that? 16 years crazy? ago? That can't be. I I moved out here in 2006, and you sent out an email to all your people saying, "Hey, man, nothing says welcome to Nashville like throwing a guy a gig." And it's like 160 people got this email at that time. I was like, what a guy, you know? Uh, so it was such a great start. And I got to hang out with you a few times. We had such great times. And then, you know, you're touring. I was touring a lot with a bunch of different bands. And, of course, I'd always run into you. You guys were always, like, headlining some festival. And uh, I'd be on the band playing at 2.30. So uh, <laughs> like always a pleasure it. to see you there. Yeah, slaying it, man. Having fun. Well, so, well really, uh, yeah, anyway. the, I, I remember lots of drinks at the Red Door. And, oh, you know, yeah. uh, I mean, that was kind of like a snapshot in time. Um, great bar. And people are always asking me, what do I do in Nashville? I'm like, well, pick up a copy of the Nashville scene. It's online. Or you can pick up the physical copy. You'll see where everyone's playing. And people are like, where can I get the best martini? And where can I get the best... Tex-Mex meal and worst good sushi in Nashville. And so like, at least after 25 years, I've got some advice to give people Well, we would spend some time there. And then we actually got to play on a record by a singer songwriter that ended up moving That's to New right. Orleans, John Roniger. John Roniger is what John really kind of Roniger. brought us together. That's exactly it. I, I forgot about that. But yeah, you did half the record. I did the other half, right? Something yes. like that. And your tracks yeah. were the, yours are the standout ones that I think this, that became the singles. And there was just it was just um, like it know. was like earn a doosh, doosh, doosh. it just Ringo great sounds and I'm like what am I doing? But um you know we take uh, this journey I, you know yeah uh, such good times. I remember that was one of the first things I did when I got to town. First time I played with Nashville players. Mm -hmm. And I remember walking in uh, and seeing Eric Fritch. The great Eric Fritch was playing keyboards. And I right. thought, wow, that guy's, he's amazing. Well, then we get the session starts. He's playing guitar. And I was like, oh, guys just pop onto whatever they happen to be sitting next to and burn on it, you know? Right. So, but I, yeah, yeah, that was fun. I remember working at, and that's funny, it's a name I haven't heard in a while. And it just seems like these seasons, they, I mean, the, the years are flowing by. John, we, you know, I, I ended up playing live with him here and there. We got to do at least one record. He ended up moving to New Orleans. 
Um, Eric Fritch, you and I would be on his call list. We'd go to his studio. We'd have a house kit. We'd play tracks for like Jim Riley. And yeah. it was um, like 13 years ago yeah, or something, yeah. man. It's amazing. I mean, everything's changed. You know, when I got here in 2006, I remember at that time, everybody said, you can't be a studio guy and a touring guy. You kind of had to remember that. Yeah. Like that existed at one time. And I remember like, maybe you told me, somebody said some great advice. They said, if a producer calls you and you're, and you're on the road, you never say, oh man, I'm in Pittsburgh. You just say, oh, I'm booked. Let yes. me get back to you. You know, you never oh, say I'm touring. Right. Yeah. And that was how it was. And it's so different now, you know? Yeah. But, I remember passing up little tours because I didn't want to give the wrong impression. I mean, if you can believe it, <laughs> that's crazy. You don't want to, you don't want to pass up anything now, but yeah, that was, no. that was, that was the case for decades. It was like, you are, you are either or. And the funny thing is, is when I moved to Nashville in 97, I said, I'm going to just take every opportunity. I don't care. And luckily it was a, a business model that is like your live work informs your studio work, your studio work informs your live work. You, ju you just take the work. It's always heartbreaking though, to say no. I always had yeah. said, I always hated that. Like, or I'm booked. Like uh, we were watching some, uh, this uh, television show with Charles Esten, the actor. And my girlfriend was talking about it. I was like, I almost played on that guy's solo record, but I was in middle America with Jason Aldean, you know, and you can't do it. It's hard to be in two places at once. Right. Well, and yet, you know, if you're out with Jason Aldean, you're fine. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> it's, I mean, to have a steady job right. in the music business is an incredible thing. Speaking of which, you're originally, I believe, from the Bay Area, right? Or is that where you That's were born? It. Yes. Oakland, California. Yes. Um, Oakland, California. And, and, you know, what a lucky break, because if you look at the San Francisco Bay Area, you will see that it's got like 30... 40, 50 bands, you know, of that have yes. come out of there in the last 40 years, you know, yeah, it's a complete hotbed of music. And it always was. And it was when I was growing up, like, you know, I auditioned for things that people would have had to flow, fly across the country for because I was just right there. And counting crows, um, all the guys in, in the band, we all, I mean, everybody came from within about 10 square miles, you know, basically. So, I mean, how lucky is that? You know, incredible. Just, I mean, that it, there. it was just, it's such a fertile breeding ground of great music. And, you know, it was just, I just interviewed our buddy near Z. He's like a, a session drummer here in Nashville. And he played on the first John Mayer record, Room for Squares, right? So a really unique, mature sound. And he played on the first Jason Mraz record, which was a very mature, unique sound, ton of international hits. And now he's making music on Music Row. So like playing on Blake, Shelton records and stuff. But I said, everybody has like a calling card, something that is, you know, that you can kind of like break the ice in an elevator. And so it's like, let's get that guy that played on the first John Mayer record. So I, you know, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn and saying that August and everything, the debut record from the Counting Crows, it, I mean, it is a masterpiece. It is like up there with like, like when I listen to Joe's Garage from Frank Zappa, it sounds like it was recorded yesterday. And that record, yeah. it just holds up and all your musical choices and the sounds and the things oh, that you chose thanks. to do. You know, our friend Nick Graffini that does the Drummer's Resource podcast. Sure, yeah. He's, interview, he's like, dude, I listened to that record every day for like five years and I still <laughs> listen to it. And so that's got to feel good, man. It's a great record. I mean, well, I'm so lucky because uh, it's really the songwriting that was so great. And, uh, you know, I had a very small part in that. Uh, but those songs were amazing. And the other thing was that T-Bone Burnett produced it. Awesome. And yeah, his whole thing was no, he, he would use no outboard effects, no anything. He wanted a microphone on a guitar sound, right? And that's yeah. it. And if you get a great guitar, great amp and dial up a beautiful tone, that's it. So what, and the same with the drums, you know, everything was, nothing was, it was all just like, get the best drum sound, and that's our sound. Before, the best yeah, commit to it, right. Yeah, and so what ends up happening is you have a record that sounds kind of timeless because there wasn't the sounds of the day. You know, there wasn't, like, if, you know, I love Don Henley, but go listen to a Don Henley record. You can tell what month it was made and what year because of the gated reverb or the, you know, whatever he's using from that time. Yep. You know, I love that, and that was... 
Uh, great. Then the difference, though, is it does put a time stamp on it. And that record, August and everything after, doesn't seem to have that stamp. But also, it's, it's so great for songwriters. I mean, the, the key, I think, to its longevity is that every new batch of songwriters hears wants to hear that record and hear Adam's, uh, you know, such beautiful lyrics, such great ideas. And so I'm really lucky because yeah. I got to be the drummer on it. And I always say it would have done just fine without me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, you know I, 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 I've heard you say that and that and that and we're also lucky in Nashville that we're living in the songwriting capital of the world. And, you know, these songs that tell you what to play are being written every day. It's yes. not always necessarily the hardest work. That is like completely at like another level. I mean, because, yeah, Adam, a poet. And at the same time, um, you know, I was doing my research, going back and looking at YouTube clips from the 90s of you performing Letterman and all these oh, great yeah. shows. And he would totally make all sorts of rhythmic and melodic inflections and changes in the moment. And it's like, it was almost like each of those songs was different every time you performed them. Yeah, it got it got so different that it was almost hard to, for the audience to tell what song it was till the chorus in some cases. But uh, but, you know, Adam is a very dynamic performer and he's easy to follow. You yeah. know, he makes big movements. And, and if you just watch what he's doing and, and that's what I would do live with Counting Crows, it was always just look at what Adam's doing and, and uh, react to that. And if you follow Adam, it's going to be a good show. You know, yeah. he's, he, I mean, you know, like any of these big guys, you know, uh, Jason Aldean is a guy that knows how to move 20,000 people. I mean, yeah. you know, he's got that and Adam does too. And so um, uh, it made for some great performances. Uh, so, so the, um, and, and I watched a lot of these live performances and you did cool things where you would have like a, uh, you would stand up and you would have a floor tom with a tea towel with a mallet and, or maybe a brush with the left hand on a djembe and a crash like waist, you know, in Dugu oh. Chancellor high in the air. And oh, it was like no. awesome. Really cool. You know, back then I was, uh, I was, uh, I emulated Steve Jordan only in his setup. You know, I wasn't playing funky grooves like him but I put my cymbals as high as they'd be. I just loved extending my arm and smacking that thing, you know? Yeah. Um, and what you probably saw now, one of the things about performing with Counting Crows back then was that maybe it's different now with in-ears. We didn't have in-ears back then. So Adam's voice would go out about, you know, once a week because he's pouring it on three nights in a row and then he couldn't Man. sing. So, a lot of times I would get to the show and they'd say, we're going acoustic tonight. And I'd be like, oh, OK. Uh, so now I would figure out how I was going to play the songs at a lower volume, you know, and so yeah. a brush or a mallet or whatever, uh, tambo instead of a snare drum, whatever I was doing, you know. So. That's cool. And so would you change the acoustic setup just to keep yourself interested or? Um, well, it kind of changed because uh, it was never set, really. It was never so good that I was like, that's what I want. So, yeah, every time it'd be like, oh, shit, I think I'll do this this time. I'll have a floor tom bass drum or something. You know, yeah. uh, I got to be honest with you. I fought it. And it was one of the reasons that I didn't work in the band because yeah. I wanted to hit hard. I wanted to rock. And I felt like, man, these people have been waiting for us to come into town for six months let's blast it over the top. It was an immature kind of musical need that the other guys didn't have. When we went acoustic, they were thrilled. You know, one guy pulls out an accordion, another guy's got a stand up. I mean, whatever, everybody had their thing. Yeah. A Martin D12. Now I get to play this tonight. But I was like sitting there like, what? I got a freaking egg shaker. This sucks. <laughs> so what, you know, I'll tell you the truth. If, if I had known about the Cajon at that point, I'd still be in County Crows, I bet. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> no, that's, a, that's a good ad for the Cajon. Was, well, really, because um, once I discovered a Cajon, you know, when you do radio tours, if you're, uh, and I've done them with a lot of different bands, you're going radio station, radio station, you can't bring a drum set in. So what do you do? You, you know, people are stuck with 
bongos or a djembe is popular, you know, but that to me, if I'm playing classic American music, it, to me, it throws a loop in it. So the cajon comes out and it sounds like John Bonham and it's like, Oh man, this is exactly what I need. Yeah. And uh, so I got a little tiny one. And uh, if uh, last time I did a radio tour, and I brought that thing. Perfect. Set it right on the table. You know. Oh, yeah. So instead of sitting on it, because I, I did a I did a show one time at the the, the whiskey and it was yeah. it was a showcase, six songs. My back was killing me sitting on that cajon, rocking out yeah. at full volume, dude. So um, you know, these companies are responding and they're like, Well, let here's a mini one, or here's one that you can mount, or here's one that's yeah. which is so smart, or you could put it on your lap, you know, between your legs. Yeah. So for us, with the acoustic shows, we would always do the djembe. The djembe was so popular. I rocked it for like 15 years. And then the cajon started yeah. getting popular. And the guys were like, that's okay. But we still love the attack and the volume of the djembe. And then now DW's got this cajon it's called the box kit. You can sit on your throne. It's got multiple playing surfaces. And you can hook a pedal up to it. And there's no latency. So you can play, wow. it, play it with multi-surface with your hands or brushes or mallets. And then you've got the pedal with no latency. So it sounds and feels like a drum set. It's incredible. Perfect. But that wasn't around in 1994. No. Yeah. Um, you know what I've done? I have, instead of sitting on them, I bought a, uh, an amp stand. Nice. You know, those little amp stand, just a little L. Yep. I'll put that sucker in that, and I'll stand behind it or I'll sit on a stool and put it right up in, to my chest and you know yeah uh and also i did a tour once on cajon and uh i had such a great time man because I, I i had a bass drum and a hi-hat and a cymbal and a cajon and so i had my kick but the it was on that stand and the thing about it was if you're sitting on a cajon you're basically looking at your feet but right. by bringing it back now I could see because I was doing songs with a new artist and I could see all the cues and and read the band as I'm playing. And so anyway, it's yeah. a little extra. Uh, it's an extra load to the car, but I recommend it. Totally. <laughs> so. And so do you um, not to speak out of turn turn, but um, do you keep in touch with these guys at all? Is there a relationship where you get a Christmas card occasionally or? Yeah. You know, for years, every time they came in town, I'd go see them live and you know, I'm so grateful for those guys. I, I, uh, uh, we had amazing times and, uh, because of the amazing songwriting and, and union that came together, that record, I still am able to, you know, it's good wind in my sails. I get mailbox money still 30 years later, whatever it is. So, I mean, I, I can't say, uh, um, uh, anything but praise for, for the band and the fact that they stay on the road and keep doing it helps record sales. So yeah, um, keeps them relevant and keeps them, uh, you know, sharp. So uh, yeah, we don't keep in close touch uh, being 2,400 miles away, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I uh, am grateful and I love those guys and I wish them all the best. So. That is awesome. And so when you left the band, did Jimbo just come immediately after you or is there a guy in the middle? No, uh, a guy named Ben Mize mm. uh, came in after me. He did it for a few years, and uh, he was a great guy. He was actually kind of a piano player that kind of started playing drums, uh, and uh, it was a you know completely different uh, style than what I was doing. And uh, I think when Jim came in, Jim uh, uh, Jim Bogus uh, came in after Ben. And he hits real hard, and uh, and so I think he's a great fit for them. He hits real hard, and and uh, pocket stays in there. Just perfect song guy for their songs. Well, you're so. a perfect song guy too, and and uh, you know I think you're a songwriter's secret weapon. I mean, I think I really are. In 2013, this is already going back, and I can't believe it. But we went to this uh, woodshed percussion. Uh, oh, our buddy yes. Dominic Sancredi. We did this event. Yeah. With multiple drummers, there was Brett Baker, who was either Dr. Dre or Jay Z's drummer percussionist programmer guy. Then there's Tracy Broussard, who plays with Blake Shelton. You and your pedigree, and then whatever I do. So you have four different <laughs> uh, tastes right there. It was like you got yeah, peanut butter in my chocolate. So um, it was so fun. <laughs> but I think out of like everyone, 
Um, and like, I don't know how many drum clinics you had done at that point, but it was like, you seemed, I went and rewatched the video. You were so comfortable. You went up oh, right oh, into man, the crowd, man. almost like a MC hey. or, or a stand up. And you were talking about what's important and what people really respond to. And then play also like playing emotions on the drum. You're like, I'm going to play this beat. I'm going to play it high energy. And then I'm going to play it depressed. And then I'm going to play yeah. it angry. And it was like, and you people were like, wow, that transcends notes on the page. That transcends all this stuff we oh, read in the so Mel nice. Bay books, right? <laughs> it was such a great, but more than anything, what I heard when you did your solos and stuff was, here's a guy who's got this swing element to his drumming. So I'm thinking like you out of all of us had this, the biggest Ringo influence, Charlie Watts. Is that where you're coming from? Who is your first guy? The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. I'll tell you, I came up on what I, I said, the three Steves. Steve Gadd, Steve Jordan, Steve Smith. Yeah. I was a huge Journey guy. They're from the Bay Area. And yes. I mean, like their record, their big records hit right between my 13-year-old eyes, you know. So yeah. those were big ones. Um I didn't discover the value of Ringo until later, actually. I kind of came up wanking, trying to fit in too much. And, and, uh, and we all go through to, that. Uh, I know. Well, uh, well, you know, it's like you can't play very well, and then you get great, and then you come back to where you can't play very well. And that's where you need to be, you know, <laughs> after totally. knowing how to do it. You know, I heard, I heard um, the great um, session drummer, Kirky B, you know, Kirk Piscara. He said um, at one point in one interview, he was like, it seems like I spend my entire career trying to sound like I don't know how to play. And that's what producers Isn't want. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it's funny. I got into Ringo um, because I went through a phase uh, where I decided I was going to study rock drummers. I was going to study what I'm trying to do Yeah. and really dig deep. And I picked Ringo, of course, is one of them. Also, I, I looked at um, Stan Lynch from Petty's band. Wow! I looked at uh, I looked at uh, um, Simon Kirk from Bad Company. Ooh, and, he's a fave. Uh, Mick Fleetwood, and so I really analyzed like, what is it they're doing? What do they sound like? What? How big was that stick he was using? How hard was he hitting? Stuff like that. Yeah. And the funny thing was, when I went to to analyze Ringo, I kept her. It's like it, the, the parts and the volumes fit so well. I kept going on other stuff. Now I'm singing the bass like, oh, yeah, I'm still supposed to be listening to Ringo. I couldn't yeah. do it. I mean, like you, you face it. Wasn't I mean, distracting. Come, no, come together or you can listen to drums. But a lot of these songs, it just, you go into the honey of the feeling of the song and now you forgot you're working on drumming. I mean, yeah. that is a testament to drumming, <laughs> you know. Totally. Um, there's a song that I always tell students to listen to, um, Dear Prudence. Not many people are aware. There's a freaking drum solo going on under the vocals on the third time through that. And it's so perfect and sleek and sitting so pretty that you almost don't notice it. You just notice a jumble, you know, and it's not until you like, listen, you're like, oh, yeah, he's going, you know, under the vocal. Well, funny thing is, I found out later, that's actually Paul McCartney playing on Dear Prudence. I was like, oh, those, those guys. I mean, you know. <laughs> Paul's a great drummer. Paul is a great, I mean, drummer. The guy that, he's like that guy, like, it's almost like uh, Stuart said, Stuart Copeland said this about Sting. He was like, that guy could pick up, he could see bagpipes in the corner, and within 20 minutes, he's making brilliant music on the bagpipes. Isn't that he funny? pick up anything. I, like, you throw a piccolo at him, and he catches it and goes... <laughs> you know, he starts, like, starts playing the um, the solo on Stars and Stripes forever. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But no, there was so much with the tea towels. Did you watch? Um, did you watch the thing on Apple? The uh, you know Disney Plus, the uh, nine hour um, I, Peter Jackson thing. No, but I have watched. I've watched a few clips. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I I, uh, I I think that uh, my son Ben is such a Beatles freak. He's studying like the the size of the sizzles and the symbol, and I'm just like Ben. You got <laughs> what are you missing while you are um, agonizing over the E string on the guitar that was on the verse? You know, I mean, like, yeah. So, so anyway, um, I've I try to try to not get too into the uh, minutia of it all. But. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not like a gear guy, but it's it's getting more like that. It was like, well, you know, Ringo always had the T towel on the snare drum, but the pitch of the drum yeah. always matched the track. And as far as the gadoom, boom, 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 every fill had a swing. It was like Gene Krupa bat was back there or yeah. something, you know? Yeah. Pretty well, amazing. I'll tell you, if you want, if you want to investigate a very simple, direct, clear uh, uh, example of Ringo's playing, um, it is in the song Come Together, but it's not the busy part. It's the part where he goes down to the bass drum and goes, Doom. I mean, try doing that. Try make it sound like he does. And yeah. you'll have to mess, you'll have to kind of adjust your ankle and wiggle your toes a little <laughs> before you, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, you know. Yeah. I mean, you listen to the way he does it. It's just sexy and lazy and it creates a feeling of ooze, you know? Yes. I mean, another yeah. one is uh, uh, you ever hear that song Sarah by Fleetwood Mac? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mick Fleetwood. Listen to just the drums. I mean, boom, boom, yeah, boom, boom, yeah, boom, boom. it's like the first notes here, second note, third note. And then he's got this symbol. Every time he hits it, it's this China something with rivets in it. Every time yeah. he hits it, it goes. Yeah. Slow motion guy. It really, it really it's is like, gorgeous. It really is gorgeous. Yeah. And, uh, one of my favorite tracks of his is um, uh, Warren Zevon, Werewolves of London. Oh, yeah. I mean, boom, boom, gosh, boom, boom, gosh. And if, if you ever see him play, dude is like six foot six or something. Yep. Big old bottom arms. And he's got these big, like, metal sticks he uses with the white tips, what are the, a head or something. He's got some deal with these stick companies. He's sitting there playing, man, and the riser is moving up and down. I could just imagine what he was doing. Oh, my you God. Know? You, know, you know, we did, we did like, some iHeart Music Festival a couple years ago, and I don't – I think we were later in the evening. I don't know how we would follow P Fleetwood Mac and, and panic at the disco, but um, he got off the kit and his drum tech put a cape on him. I've never seen anything like this. It was like, he was like a superhero. Like he got off, he was all sweaty and his drum tech put a cape on him. Like, I don't want more clothes on me after I play. I I get no get. Clothes. And so yeah. he, put, he got the cape. I don't know what the whole story of it. He's got the towel. He's wiping his sweat and, <laughs> Man, incredible. Yeah. Man, just, I, yeah, just I, I rock and roll, my, man. I used to have my guy place a single monocle in my eye, and then I'd walk off stage. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so tell us, great. Um, po uh, post show, I mean, uh, post Counting Crows, you know, no, no Moss was growing on you. You went on to work with Third Eye Blind and Loose, like all like a lot of Bay Area bands. What, how did those calls come about? And like, what was the experience? Well, I'll tell you, um, Third Eye Blind, I, I went into that too quickly. I mean, like, I was, I had uh, just come out of Counting Crows, and Stephen Jenkins uh, from uh, Third Eye Blind, he was calling me because they had the same management as Counting Crows uh, used to. Mm -hmm. And so he said, man, you got to come down here and check it. So, you know, I wasn't ready to jump in another band, and... I did it anyway, and I shouldn't have, uh, because not only was I not really ready to jump in another band, but Third Eye Blind, I mean, those guys were like rock stars from the jump. <laughs> I mean, 
They were crazy. Uh, it was crazy. Songs yeah. were amazing. Um, uh, and yet it was pretty uh, chaotic and weird. And I had a little money in the bank. I wasn't taking much guff at that point. And so it didn't really work out. And uh, <laughs> I got to tell you that I can laugh about this now, but Stephen Jenkins called and asked me, even after it was, it was done, he, uh, I, I told him I wasn't interested in doing it anymore. Uh, he called and asked me to play on one song, Sumi Charmed Life. <laughs> and no! I said, I know, I know I where said, this is going. I said, no, nah, man, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I'm not interested. Click. That one? Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. his great revenge was that I had to hear that song every time I turned on the radio for the next two years. Like, ah, oh, damn, I should have. I should have said yes to that. So the guy that came in was that the was that the Brad guy, Brad? Uh... Um, I'm not sure who ended up playing on it. It might have been Brad. It might have been Mike Urbano. Um, there was a few drummers hanging around that scene. Yeah, Mike Urbano so, uh, uh, went on to do the Smash Mouth thing. Yes, I believe. Yeah, he did that. He did a lot of stuff in the Bay Area. He's a he was like the big guy in the Bay Area for for sessions. You know, I think he, I think he still lives uh, there. I think I believe. Last I heard, he was playing with this artist, uh, an Italian artist, uh, like the Italian Bruce Springsteen is what I heard. Uh, take it. And, take it. Know, to there's pictures away. of him. Yeah. So, uh, hey, can I get a quick drink of water? Do we have an editor? Oh, my God. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I just got it. Uh, I'll be right back. It's just oh, right there. He's got it. Yeah. Bring oh. the cat back. Uh, so apparently Steve's got a new cat. And we're talking about cats. And uh, if you guys are just listening to this, uh, Steve's got this. Awesome leopard print couch. His backdrop is very, very cool. Uh, super well put together feng shui. He's getting a drink of water. I miss my cat. I had a cat, Sassy the cat, and she passed oh away in 2015. And I miss having a cat, but I travel so much. Hey, Steve, right. I was telling everyone about, um, you know, how you got a new cat, and I miss my cat. It's been like seven oh. years since I had a cat. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. You know, I uh, when I moved down to Murfreesboro, I got a, a little cat named Jean, <laughs> and uh, she's she's amazing. She is, uh, uh, you know, I just uh, I had always been a dog person, and I realized uh, how interesting cats were, and then I saw this documentary uh, called Lion in the Living Room. It's about how cats are kind of wild animals, right? Yeah. And if you if you chucked your cat outside, it'd They'd be him. fine. <laughs> They'd be fine. Yeah. You throw your dog outside, it would claw at the door until it died on the doorstep. I mean, it's <laughs> terrible. But, you know, cats are badass, man. And yeah. so watching this cat and, you know, what it really is, and I know you're you're so into deep thought, but – this cat is in the now. This cat is living in the moment every second. And that is inspiring and a good reminder to try to yeah. do it, you know? Well, I, I remember, mean, the I, run I remember around, oh, sorry, so sorry. Um, you know, this is the side effect of Zoom. It's like if you have two passionate people yeah. in, a <laughs> yeah. in a normal situation, it's not going to be a problem. When, but in, with the slight delay, it is like, yeah, yeah we are flaming yeah. left and right. I'll be your grace note. You be my grace note. And we'll step all over each other. Um, but it seemed like when we did that thing in 2013, um, I, it seemed like I was having a quarter life crisis and then you were going through something. I remember like all of us talking at the airport and you were like yeah, getting into some like that. some serious phil philosophical stuff. And we were, we were armchair philosophizing. And, and I was like, it seems like an early, uh, early midlife crisis I was having, and it seemed like it was the same for you. Well, I'll tell you what happened with me was it, it got really weird. I quit drinking in 2009, and I got real into, uh, you know, I, I did AA for three years. Okay, I was going to ask you if you did the program, yeah. Yeah, and it was amazing. I love AA. Eventually, it seemed like... Uh, you know, they have some ideas uh, that I didn't quite believe with, kind of like if you stop going, you're doomed. And right. I didn't really feel like it was like that for me. 
But um, what I got out of it was this kind of, on this path of kind of uh, uh, spirituality of uh, 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 and and it led from one thing to another. Uh, but what I discovered eventually for me was that I had been using drumming to feed my ego for a long time. And the things that I got out of it, uh, besides enjoying playing and, you know, making a living, it's what I do, it's what I'm good at. But I found that I also enjoyed the big shotness of it. I loved being special. I liked people cheering for me and looking at me. And I went through this weird phase where I couldn't really play live without feeling that. And mm. yeah, and it was serious and I didn't uh, know what to do about it. And it was about that time um, when we were doing that, that I was kind of going through this thing where it was hard for me to play in front of others. I still enjoyed doing sessions because I'm working on a song. It's not about me, but something about getting on stage and under the lights and playing drums seemed inauthentic at that time. Wow. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Because that's, I mean, that's part of it is like, you know, a lot of our, our self-worth and our self-esteem comes from our job. We were lucky enough to take a passion and turn it into a job. And so if you take away the applause, which is part of the music making process, would you still yeah. do it? It raises a lot of questions. I mean, well, because, and, yeah, you know, and the thing is, uh, uh, it's a completely valid um, desire to, you know, uh, be accepted and loved by others. That's completely normal. And it's a byproduct of what we happen to do. Um, the only problem is if you kind of make that the focus, which yeah. I was probably doing more than I should have. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, I, I remember having some cocktails with you at the red door and then it was like, um, and then, so what was the, you were just like, uh, this is a dead end or this isn't getting in the way of my life for drinking. Yeah. Or yeah. Uh, you know, I drank too much and, and I did it for a long time mm -hmm. and I didn't, get into trouble until the very end, but I wasn't one of those that uh, crashed cars and got DUIs and, and uh, lost my house and all that. I was what you would call functional. Um, right. and, and yet uh, it is a progressive thing. You know, I, I thought, Hey man, I'll drink four beers the rest of my life, six beers a night, you know, but it gets to seven and eight and eventually I decided for myself, I had to make a change. And when I did, it was a big change because yeah. a lot of the people I played with were heavy drinkers. I mean, it's just, I kind of fell in on tours where everybody's drinking a lot. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people I hung out with. You know. And so a lot of the things I did playing gigs and, <laughs> you know, going yeah. to bars to watch football games and see people. Um, so it was a big adjustment uh, in that way. And what yeah. I found was that I kind of had to find there were some avenues of music income that I had to kind of readjust. Like when you quit drinking, even though I would never tell anybody else to quit drinking or, you know, it was just for me, but it does kind of put a, a light on everyone else's behavior Sure. You know, even without saying anything. And I remember uh, a good friend of mine coming up to me. We were at a club watching a show and he came up and said, hey, man, it's only my second beer. He said, I was like, man, I don't care how much you drink, you know, <laughs> but he felt like he had to kind of show me, hey, I'm being cool tonight. It's like, man, I don't. So, yeah, you know, well, I mean, I guess if you're drinking, you know, if you're if you're drinking seven or eight IPAs every night, that's going to leave a mark. I mean, I can't even imagine having to burn off all those calories, buddy. Holy cow. Well, you know? no kidding. And that's one of the things that uh, immediately, like, I could eat whatever I want. It, it's been since 2009. Yep. And to this day, I eat whatever I want, whenever I want. I don't have to worry about my weight. 
And before, I mean, yeah, you have like, you know, what, a couple thousand calories and then well, sleep and you look all great. night. <laughs> Dude, I mean, you look great. Well, I, mean, I have never seen you so lean, buddy. I, and so are you doing any uh, exercise like riding a mountain bike or running or doing anything or going for walks or? Well, I'll tell you, the only thing I'm doing in that regard is disc goal. I don't know if you're into if really? you this. Like the, like the Greeks, it, man. like the disc. Yeah. <laughs> You know what disc golf is? You throw like frisbees oh, yeah, uh, yeah. into a into a basket, a chain basket. We have some beautiful courses in Nashville, and basically, it's it's a beautiful nature hike. Yeah. Even if you're playing, if you're playing terribly and it all sucks, yeah. You look around and go, "Hey, I'm in the middle of cedars of Lebanon. That's fine." <laughs> you know, <laughs> they have a course there that's like a beautiful old course there. Uh, so anyway, I, that's kind of my only exercise. I, I have to admit, um, I, I love biking, but I haven't been doing it down here. And mm -hmm. so, well, uh, and you're doing some, yeah, and you're doing some teaching. I remember you, um, I remember you writing a book called Groove Control and you're talking about doing yeah. some teaching from the house. Um, are you doing a lot of online teaching or are you braving the come in with your mask and, and sit on the other side oh. of the room kind of thing? Yeah. <laughs> I'm having folks in. I'm doing um, uh, in-person teaching. Yeah. Online teaching is available. But what I do more of in that regard is more conversations. Um, Consulting. I have a, a, yeah, sure. Uh, because for me, I kind of want to be in the room. And I know the technology will get better, but it's frustrating to try to play drums and then they play drums and you play drums. So, yeah. but you can have a conversation about, ideas you can talk about feel time you know uh, sure. all that yeah um and and so i like to do that but i do love in-person teaching i mean i uh i have uh when i moved down to murfreesboro i i uh got a uh, a house that had a perfect studio right off the front door so people come in i have two drum sets and you know everything's set up ready to rock and i call it murfreesboro music lab so uh, great. Uh, yeah, man. And uh, MML, you got the merch, in. you got the hats and the shirts and everything. Moomoolab.org. I got to get on that. Uh, but uh, I also have been teaching one day a week at a cool little place called uh, Carpe Artista, yeah. which is in Smyrna. And they have a cool thing where it's like you have uh, students taking photography and painting and acting. Wow, I didn't know that. That's super cool. And music. And uh, so they have a, a bunch of different things going on there. And it's a wonderful spot right in the middle of Smyrna, Tennessee. Again, two drum sets. I walk in there, you know, with my computer and we're, we're playing to videos. It's great. So, uh, so that's really all, you know, what I'm doing. So, Steve, what about the, um, how have you responded to the, um, this pesky pandemic? I mean, are you like... I mean, me teaching in the same room as another person, like I've been avoiding it at all costs. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I, uh, I have, I got a double vaccination. Yep, me too. And then just before Christmas, I got COVID. <laughs> you did? I thought you said I got the boost. Um, oh, no. So I got, I got a boost. All right. I got a great natural immunity. I hope, but yeah, good I had COVID good for you. I mean, I, th I feel like it's inevitable and let's, let's bring on the antibodies, you know, I mean, it, it's at yeah. this point, That's but it. I mean, uh, so what w was it? Um, were you able to knock it out in a couple was, of days? It was not a couple of days, but it certainly wasn't bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, the worst, uh, I had it just before Christmas, the week before Christmas, it's about wow. five days where but I didn't feel that bad. And the weird thing was every day I'd get up thinking, well, it's probably gone now. No, I still feel kind of bad, but not terrible. And that went on for five days. I didn't lose my sense of smell, but things Thank started God. tasting different. Oh. And so that's, I knew I was like, I took a sip of orange juice. I'm like, I think this orange juice went bad. It's like, Oh no, I'm just whacked right now. <laughs> that's a and nightmare a for an Italian. It's a nightmare. to. Oh, I no, bet. Can you imagine that? Oh, well, I went to eat my ice cream at night, which I eat every night, and it tasted like chemicals. I'm like, no, <laughs> COVID, you bastard! I love that you <laughs> traded in beer for uh, for ice cream every night. That seems like a good uh, trade. I, 
Oh well, I sure did. I uh, man, I I uh, I probably get uh, the same amount of calories. I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, well, man, I'm trying to think where to go from here. Ah, yes, you just started a new podcast called Letters to an Aspiring Musician with Steve Bowman. And you have the introductory, hey, this is what this podcast is about. And you have a, an initial episode that I consume that I consumed and I loved. Um, it's you telling stories. And I think from from you telling the stories, I, is it the goal to shave years off this process for an aspiring musician? Well, Here's what happened. I found myself with 30 years of experience in the music business, right? And yet, man, I'm not 19. I don't want to go. I don't want to hustle. I don't want to do all this stuff anymore. Right. But, you know, another thing about being my age is that I want to help people. And, and it's so weird because I helped myself for the rest, for most of my life. But at a certain point, I realized how good it helped. It felt to help others. And, you know, everybody knows how good it feels to grab some peanut butter for a, an old woman at the grocery store. You know, it sure. energizes you. Yeah. And you've known this for years. You've been this way for years. I wasn't. I mean, um, I like to say if, if you, re you get a perfect present for, some, present for someone and you hand it to them, the feeling as they're opening it, that feels good, right? Ooh, yeah. Yeah. That's a great feeling. And so what I discovered was I need to make people, I, I, I feel good myself when I help others. And so with this knowledge, I thought, what if I could put all this information, all the things I think are important, all the lessons I've learned, you know, first-hand accounts, in the trench stories. I got buddies I can call for interviews. And my thinking was, what if I could give all the information I learned to a 19-year-old or a 20-year-old or a 40-year-old who wants to be a musician? Yeah. The idea is, what do you wish you knew when you were coming up? I mean, all of and, it, dude. I mean, yeah. yeah. So in lieu of a book, because I think it, I heard on the interview, you're like, well, I'm not going to write a book. I'm going to do this podcast. And it's in this new media. It's in this new format that's like on fire. I mean, everyone's got a podcast. The deal is with this, if there's like, it's so funny. Um, someone gave me the stats. I guess my podcast is in the top 1% of podcasts on the planet. I don't feel wow. like that. But it's pretty. It's actually pretty easy to do because ninety nine percent of the people start the podcast do um, a couple episodes, or they do it for one year. They realize how difficult it is and how time consuming it is, yeah. and they stop. Right. So. Yeah. So. But no, I think it's well, an honestly, awesome thing. And, and honestly, that's probably what I'm going to do because my intention was to get ten episodes and get all this information: the who, what, where, why, how everything I could think of. And that's it. And like, the nice thing is, I'm hoping it won't be something that you have to stay current. It's something I mean, and, you know, it will in time, but it's evergreen people can go check. Yeah, people can check it out a year from now, five years from now and still get what I'm hoping to boil down to basic um, advice that would save you time, money or effort from your journey as a musician. And Steve, I love the cover of the podcast. Everyone's doing this 10 year challenge. <laughs> Yours is like, this is oh, me yeah. at 19 and this is me now. Yeah. The 40 year challenge or something. <laughs> I'm 50, I'm 55 uh, this month. So how did this happen? So, yeah. happy, happy early birthday. I know. Well, thanks. You know, it, it's great. Uh, as my dad said, aging beats the alternative. So that's right. Uh, you you could take, be taking a dirt nap. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. A total dirt yeah. nap. Well, man, we talked uh, about groove. Uh, your the the book, the groove control. You gave me a copy of that. I never really dived in, but I know the the idea behind groove control grew out of this. It's almost like a balance between the limbs things, where you want to have the freedom to like accentuate one limb and have the other three be cooking, and just have that word. It's a balance thing, right? Is that really well, the idea? Yeah. The idea was to try to get uh, your limbs locked up so that um, so that you iron out all the wrinkles and potential wrinkles in your facility. And theoretically, whatever you think you can just do, you don't get those kinks, you know, like, oh, I was trying to do this and it, oh, 
I guess I haven't worked that out because it's all muscle memory. If yeah. you do the same thing 10 times, it's going to be better than the first, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, at the time, I remember giving that book and I wrote something really snarky. I was trying to make a joke. I hope you got it. I got it. I it's, in my, like, it's in my little chest right over there. Yeah. And, and I wrote something in it like, hey, uh, Jason asked me to give you this. Groove control. <laughs> <laughs> That's like uh, my teacher at North Texas State, Ron Fink, when I was graduating, he wrote one of my method books. Rich, you're like a great outdoorsman, always hunting and fishing for the notes. <laughs> so great, great. Great, great sense of humor, ah. man. But you know, I love what I love about your playing is is you're, you 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 commit to patterns. Though you're, everything that is informing your drum part is is the vocal and the storytelling. And you know that if it's a sad song, or you know that it's a happy song, and your choices are going to reflect that. And um, the fills are all super appropriate. And then another thing that I noticed, two things that you can do to change the feel or the percolation or the, the way things are moving and feeling is more grace notes on the snare drum or less grace notes on the snare drum. And then the urgency of the hi-hat. Is it with the shank of the stick? Is it a little bit more louder and maybe a little bit more on top of the beat than the other things? I stole all that shit from you, you know? Oh, well, man, you, you do that without even thinking about it. And, uh, and I mean, it, uh, you know, I appreciate it, but, yeah. but yeah, I mean, I've heard you play for years and, and it's all there. Uh, I think uh, uh, what's neat about you saying that is that you actually thought about how to verbalize it because really a lot of this stuff that separates the good from the great, you know, is, stuff that isn't on paper all the time. People don't talk about feel because it's not as easy to notate. You know, you can it's write hard to teach feel, man. Yeah, it really and, is. And so, uh, so anyway, I appreciate that, but I know you have always been, I mean, that's why you do records and that's why, you know, you help sell the message of a song with your drumming and that makes you indispensable. Uh, oh man, you know. well, that's what we want to bring to the people around us, you know. Yeah, singer songwriters, uh, some producers, uh, some band, some of them don't even know why you're so valuable. They just know that it's it feels better when you're there playing, and it's they can get better into the song because the feel, you know. Yeah. So oh, uh, yeah. Hi. Hey, how long did you after I? This was like I can't believe this was about a decade ago, if not longer, but um. For fun, on Sunday through Wednesdays, I would play in town with this band and we would dress up like nerds and we would play oh. 80s new wave music and we would call the spasmatics. And then when I was just, it kind of got weird and unmanageable because I'd be getting home at like three in the morning oh. and I'd have to be getting yeah. drum sounds. Like, so, um, so you did it for a while. How long did you do that? I love those guys. I just got great? a message for, yeah. Uh, I just uh, uh, got a message from Kirby. He said, uh, uh uh, so anyway, uh, but yeah, I did that for a couple years and I was the sub for Brett Smith. Oh, for Brett. And, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But then Brett got so busy that I did. I was the only guy that did it for a couple of years and uh, it was great. I love those guys that um, eventually um, I, I think I got too busy, too, because we were doing dates where it's like fly dates, where it's like every gig is. Two and a half days. <laughs> so you, get, you gotta get there, come back, and and uh, so I I stopped doing it a while ago. But uh, but I love those guys, man. Totally, um, they were yeah. such good friends. And it's so funny because we're dressing up as nerds playing '80s music, but yeah. every person on the stage was badass man, a burning person. musician. I mean, yeah. Oh man, and all you know. It's like, yeah, he's playing with Kelly Pickler and he's going out with this guy. And he's, I mean, they're all coming back and we're dressing as nerds. Uh, but the music was so good. Uh, everybody was so good that I, I never had any shame about that. I, I mean, oh, I no, you get to play like, and, uh, like video killed the radio star going into My Sharona, going yeah. into Kajagoo and Aha. Girl. Come on. I loved it. Yeah. All these great songs. After a while. I got a roto tom set up, man, yes. and I was doing that gig with five roto toms in front of me. Right, five, nice. I'm, I'm sorry, Six, I missed eight, that. Ten, oh, I, I was bringing it down to that place on the uh, Demumbrian, the uh, Doghouse well, Saloon. 
Yeah. They uh, I had six, eight, six, eight, 10, 12, 14 over a bass drum. <laughs> that was nice, so fun. Steve. Who was your yeah. character? My, my character was Ernest Winston Powell III. What was yours? <laughs> That's good. I was uh, Ty Conderoga. Which Ty is Conderoga? Pencil? Yeah. Yeah. You, you, well, Ty Conderoga pencils. That was oh, the yeah. joke. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, got, I still have a name tag. It says Ty Conderoga. <laughs> it's really funny. I, I had a, I had a um, suitcase filled with my spasmatics outfit so all my suspenders and my taped glasses and my high waters yeah. and, and i had it sitting in a suitcase for 10 years it's like just in case someone calls me to sub because there's like 15 yeah. different spasmatics and then the other day uh, a couple months ago i was cleaning the garage and i finally said i think i'm gonna finally just throw this stuff away that's it <laughs> yeah <laughs> crazy well, i still have a box i have a box somewhere with a wig glasses uh suspend whatever it was but like i say that band was so good yeah. that I could walk out there looking like a fool and just look at the crowd and just say, all right, you guys are about to get blown away. So, yep. you know, laugh all you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's you know. the power of music, Steve. The fact that, you know, our love for this craft is, you know, you're on stage and David Letterman is introducing you in 1994, a great new band, Counting Crows, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and next thing you know, you're dressed up as a nerd and it's the, it's the same thing. You, you know, know it's it's so true. I I uh, try to keep uh, uh, my attitude in check because, man, every year for a while I was playing the Music City Marathon. I'd be like in a McDonald's parking lot at seven in the morning and it's raining. I'm like, yeah, what am I doing? You know, and uh, <laughs> but the same guys I was playing with, I'd end up, you know, doing dates, and now That's we're right. on the road. You know, so man. Uh, yeah. Keep that the, attitude together. <laughs> the small gigs turn into the big gigs, man, which is really, really yeah. always exciting. And hey, man, I'm feeling yeah. sexy today. Check this out, man. This is this is a kind of a kid's show, but there's like a sexy woman on my shirt. Red Monkey Designs. My buddy, uh, Tori Pendergrass has a company called Red Monkey, redmonkeydesigns.com. And he makes like leather cuffs and belts and guitar straps Ooh. for like Zach Wilde and Kiss and all these huge metal bands. And our band, like for the last, I don't know, like 13, 14 years, and I, one time I had these shirts in every color and I made the mistake of drying the shirts. So for about six years, I've had no red monkey shirts. And then a, a care package shows up yesterday. Uh, and I'm, uh, There's nothing like a brand new shirt that fits you. Amazing. You just feel like a million bucks. And it looks cool. Good logo. Yeah, man. Yeah. The guy is great. Steve, we got to catch up in the flesh. This was so awesome yeah. to do this. And I'm oh, so I'm glad so you're glad. doing well, man. Well, thank you so much. Um, I just want to finish up uh, by saying this, uh, this podcast is hopefully a way I can take my career as a musician and use it to help people, right? Which is what I'm trying to do. And, and I hope it will. So I, 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 I think it will. Speaking. I really think it will, Steve. And I think that some people figure it out earlier. Some figure, people figure it out later. But at some point, we all figure out that our purpose in life, everyone's, is to help people, you know, and whether we do it yeah. through music or our gift or our experience, our yeah. storytelling. So the podcast is called Letters to an Aspiring Musician with Steve Bowman. It's uh, on Apple Podcasts. Yes. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Love it. Uh, ask for it by name. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, leave a rating and a review. And uh, also, if the kids wanted to... Uh, Get in touch with you. Tell us about your dot coms and your socials. Yeah, um, it is pretty simple. I am at uh, Murfreesboro Music Lab, which can be found at mumulab.org. M U M U L A B.org. So reach me there. Come That's on right. out. Mumu Lab. And you need, yeah, you need your swag, man. I know. I got to get hit to the swag. Uh, but. Yeah, I'm I'm always five seven years behind you in these things, so I'll get there. You know. <laughs> well, the kids are the kids are on TikTok, and I haven't done it yet, but I know I'm talking to more and more drummers, and they are loading all their videos up to TikTok now, which is crazy. Right. So I guess you don't have to dance on TikTok; you can do yeah, some drumming yeah. on TikTok. You Good. know. Good. Well, yeah, just trying to keep up with the kids. But um, Steve, thank you so much, yeah. buddy. I'm so glad you're great. Oh man. My pleasure. What a pleasure to see you and speak to you again, Rich. Thank you.
Oh, man, the pleasure is mine. Everyone, that's Steve Bowman. Check out Steve Bowman. Every go, everybody check out that first Counting Crows record. I'm telling you, it's like an earwig. It'll never escape you. Uh, it's a masterpiece, <laughs> man. Congratulations, and yeah. thanks for your con- contribution to modern music making. That will always be in style. And to all you listeners out there, thank you so much for the support of the podcast. You can really help us here by subscribing, sharing, rating and leaving us a nice review it really really does help keep coming back for the good stuff we'll be here and we'll see you next time thanks steve (laughs) this has been the rich redmond show subscribe rate and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts